Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our afternoon session today at Bangor University on studying in the UK your questions answered. So hopefully we'll be able to answer many of your questions um, because you've come here to study at Bangor University from overseas. Many of you in the UK for the first time, first time away from home, first time experiencing um, the UK education system. So the reason we've uh, set up this, um, this session today is to hopefully answer some of the questions you may have um, in readiness for the course starting in the next few days. And we have a panel of academics here today who will hopefully answer all your questions um, and delay all your fears about studying in the UK. Um, I'll introduce them quickly first of all, say a few words, and then uh, my, uh, my panel members here can then say a little about themselves and, um, and their experiences at Bangor as academics. Um, on my right, right at the far end, we have Jean Ma, a PhD student from the School of Law. Next to me, Dr. Mohamed Mabrouk at the School of Electronic Engineering. On my right, Dr. Anil Shirsat at the School of Biological Sciences. And on the far left here, Dr. Ama Ayo from the School of Law. Experts in their fields, and experts in the UK education system, I hope. Right, well, um, first of all, welcome to Bangor. It's great to see so many of you here today uh, at this session. The first time we've done this kind of session, so uh, we are filming it, and it'll be on the university um, internet, so maybe people can look back on it if they missed it um, today. Um, in Bangor, we're proud to welcome students from all over the world. We've been in existence for 130 years, and during that time, we've graduated students from the same number of countries uh, during that time. Um, the chances are uh, that you're not the first person from your country to come to Bangor and to study successfully here, and I hope sincerely that you won't be the last. Currently, we have around 1,800 students uh, from all over the world outside of the EU, EU uh, at Bangor, about 15% of the total student population. Um, about half of those students are from the southeast, east, and far east of Asia. 15% from North Africa and the Middle East, 10% from Central and South America, and 7% from Sub-Saharan Africa. So a whole mix of nationalities uh, and cultures studying in uh, Bangor University. We're proud also to have um, academics from all over the world uh, working uh, with us. I think about 25% of the university academics are from overseas, so very diverse uh, range of academics with a whole wealth of experience to help you and we're delighted to welcome the panel here some of them here to answer the questions you may have about studying in the UK. Right before I open questions to the floor a um, number of students here have questions I'll give the panel an opportunity to say a few words about the major differences um, that uh, they've noticed um, working with international students and a little bit about themselves as well. So if I start from my right with um, Jean Ma Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Xiang Ma from School of Law. Uh, I did my first degree in China and I did two masters in both China and the UK. And then I did PhD program in Bangor University. Uh, the thing I noticed most about studying here in the UK is that teachers seldom tell you what to do next. Instead, they would encourage you to figure out what to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ma. Mohamed. Ah, thank you, Alan. Uh, I am Mohamed Mabrouk. I did my first degree in electrical engineering at Basra University in Iraq. And the most, you know, I would say easy point to pick from where I came from and the UK education is how easy to contact member of staff in the university, starting from the university level to the college, to the department, lecturers, deans, head of departments, open door policy is something really Britain proud of, you know, from, from education point of view. Thank you. Dr. Arnel Chirsat from uh, School of Biological Sciences. Okay, I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Biological Sciences and professionally I'm a genetic engineer and a cloner. 
And my background is slightly odd. I was born and brought up in Uganda in East Africa, but I've been in the UK for a very long time. I did my A-levels here, and I took my first degree at UEA, um, the University of East Anglia in Norwich, and then went down to Cardiff in the medical school, and then I went up to Durham University for my doctorate, and I came down here. So unfortunately, I can't tell you very much about the university education in my home country, because I've done everything here. Thank you. And finally, um, Dr. Um, Amayo from Law. Hello, everyone. Um, I did my first degree in Nigeria and also went to the law school there, then came over to the UK to do my master's and my PhD um, at Nottingham. Um, one of the interesting features of the UK educational system, which I have found really, really encouraging for me as an individual who likes expressing her independent thought is the fact that your lecturers encourage you to say what you feel you should say, but you need to be cautious. When I was back in my home country, I could not have an opinion on certain issues, but here I can say anything I want to say, provided I am polite. So feel free to say what you need to say. Thank you. Okay, some a bit of advice there before we start to the question. So ladies and gentlemen, the panel. Okay then, let's uh, go to the floor and have the first question from um, a student, uh, Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa. Um, I just wanted to find out how many lectures would I have? My name is Mona Lisa from Nigeria, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Mahan? Yeah. Usually how many lectures will depend on the course you will do. But what I will advise is to attend the lectures. Mm. This is the main thing. And especially for, it's, it's, it's important for national or international students, for local students or international students. Because that's how you learn. When you attend lectures, you learn more. At least 30% of your learning will be within the lectures hours. And then you go and revise and, and get your you know, uh, knowledge to more advanced. So you need to attend the lectures. It will depend on the course you do. Uh, and the other thing for international students you have to be aware of as well. If you don't attend lectures, it might affect your visa status. Mm. In the last few years, we are uh, you know, asked by the border agency if there are any international students not attending certain percentage of lectures, they will be reported to. I think you, know, you, you will receive a few emails or letters from your department, but at the end it might affect your visa as well. Um, Jean? Well, uh, if you're a PhD student, you might not have many like classes as you expected. Instead, you might will support some lab-based sessions, you might will lead uh, some seminars, you might even ask, be asked to teach uh, undergraduate courses if you get enough training. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Um, timetabling really, in a sense, is dependent on the timetabling unit because it depends on how they can fit you, fit all the students into certain rooms and certain periods of time. So it's not all, you can't actually say that for any particular week you're going to have the same number of lectures or the same number of practicals. It'll vary widely. Um, some of the MSc students in my course have an extremely hard workload in the first semester and then it's much lower in the second semester. So it just depends on the degree you're doing, the modules you're doing and so on. A lot of it is run by the timetabling unit. Mm -hmm. oh. um, what I would just, just I'd like to contribute in addition to what my colleagues have said is you have to make my bangor your friend. If you've not logged onto my bangor now, after this session, pull up a peer guide and tell the person, I need to look at my Bangor. By next week at the latest, you should have your timetable and its sessions scheduled for you. This week also, you have the opportunity to meet your personal tutors. So please, if you've not met them, arrange meetings with them. When you go into my Bangor, you would see, depending on whether you're doing compulsory modules or optional modules. You see on the timetable which modules come up on which day and you would see the time that they come up. So adhere to those times. You, some of you may be doing tutorials 
and you might have dedicated sessions timetable for you outside your normal routine please be aware of that one thing i always like students to be conscious of is the fact that um, academics sometimes have to travel for conferences so you might have a scheduled lecture during the week which may not come up on as a previously arranged ensure you read your emails check blackboard communication will be given to you no academic would leave you without telling you that there will be a rescheduled lecture at some other time so please take up that responsibility of ensuring that you are aware of when your lecture takes place if it's been readjusted because of constraints when the rescheduled lecture is going to be but my bangor is your best friend let that be your bible throughout your stay in bangor could i just add something to that um, last year we had a practical class of about 100 students in the second year an undergraduate class and only about 60 turned up the reason why only 60 turned up is that been a change in the timetabling and we'd informed them all by email and on blackboard about the timetabling change but they said oh we didn't look at that because we only look at facebook um, mm. it doesn't work okay mm. you have to access the university email system at least once a day because the sorts of changes which happen in the timetabling could happen at any time there might be a clash of modules or a clash of timetabling and we need to change and we'll let you know but you have to access your emails or look on Blackboard every day, at least once a day. Just one um, little point in addition to that is, the rooms that would be scheduled for, and it's when um, Dr. Anil was saying this that I was reminded of something that also happened last session. Sometimes your usual classrooms may not be available due to emergencies or something. It's not something that happens frequently, but I know that last year we had some, um, don't get into the routine of just sticking to a room and then you forget to check whether a particular week that room is not available make sure you check the room and you don't find yourself getting to a particular room and that's not where the lecture is taking place for that room it's uh, for that week and it's been rescheduled to another room so check both the date the day of the week as well as well as the venue and also be careful about, you know, sometimes we have some lecturers um, exchanging or sharing modules, who is going to teach what. And hopefully you have a lovely stay in Bangor. Thank you all, some comprehensive uh, answers there. Hopefully that's um, um, given you the answers you're looking for. Uh, my Bangor and your Bangor email address, obviously very, very important. Okay, we can maybe expand on this a bit later, but I'd like to move on to the second question, uh, if I may. Hello, my name is Peter from the School of English. Um, I'm doing a PhD study here, thank God. So my question is, how will I know if I have passed or failed the course? Important question, how will I know if I've uh, passed or failed the course? Uh, Dr. Dr. Um, well, <coughs> once you've handed a piece of work in, it will be marked. And the sort of marking system we use here in Bangor is a categorical marking system, which is a bit strange because it works in categories. So in the old days when I was a student, we had one mark, like 55 or 58 or 65 or 70, and that was it. Whereas now we mark in categories. And I'll just tell you, for instance, what the top categories are. There's an A minus, which goes from 70 to 77. Then there's an A, 78 to 83, A plus, 84 to 89 and A star 90 to 100, okay? So in the old days, you might have just got 70%, whereas now, if you get 70%, you'll be assigned to a categorical mark, which is A minus. And because A minus goes from 70 to 77, oddly enough, you'll get the average of that, which is about 74. So it's to your benefit, the categorical marking. And as far as how do you know whether you've passed or failed the course, the rules in the university generally say that all coursework must be handed back to the students at the maximum within four weeks of receipt. Okay, so you should get it back straight away. Well, not straight away, within four weeks. Four weeks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. That's the absolute limit. Hopefully you'll get it before. Okay, Dr. Mohamed. Yeah. Well, when it comes to passing uh, your modules or passing, you know, progressing from year to year, for example, uh, 
it is as you said, different colleges or different departments, they have different categories. In electronics, for example, we have, you know, first class yeah. 2, 1, 2, 2. First class 70 plus, yeah. 2, 1, 60. But what I want you to notice as well, especially in your first year, maybe you came from a background where you are used to marks of 95, 98, you know, 90 plus, because you are good students. But in university life, it's quite different. You will find some time, you get a mark of 60s or 50s. That's why the pass mark here mainly, uh, you know, 40% for undergraduates and I think, you know, some of the master degrees for, you know, 50%. So don't try to compare what you used to of marks, what you will have. If you think this is not right, try to talk to your tutor. So, well, I'm doing well or not, and you'll be surprised sometimes. Maybe you have 65, and then is the highest mark in the class, hmm. but you don't know. So th this is something usually students panic in the first semester when the you know marks you know comes in. And the other point I want to mention as well, you know, we talk about feedbacks. If you submit an assignment or you submit some work, yes, within four weeks you have to have a feedback. So don't look at the marks only, because we are here not to just pass from year to year. We are learning. And if you want to learn, you have to ask for feedback and use these feedback for your own you know, improvements of your you know, module or, 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 or knowledge. So always hustle your lecturers. Not too much. <laughs> well, try. No one will tell you, do not ask for feedback. It's important. I forgot to mention that the pass mark for undergraduate degree courses is 40%, okay? But this year, for the first time, the pass mark for the master's courses is 50%, so it's gone up. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. As far as marking is concerned, I talked to you about an A-star grade of 90 to 100. In my entire career, I've never given anyone that sort of mark, okay? We just don't do that because that sort of mark implies essentially that the work can be submitted for publication hmm. straight away without any change at all. And I've never, I wish I, one of these days I hope to get something like that, but I, I, I live in hope. I haven't so far. Um, as far as the marking is concerned, this comment about 60, 65 actually being quite a good mark is true. Um, for instance, we have a lot of Saudi Arabian students in our department and they need to go on to postgraduate courses. Now, they normally in their home universities used to get marks of 80, 85 and so on, but the Saudi embassy knows that the equivalent, a good mark in the UK would be 60. So if they want to get onto a PhD course, then they need an average mark of 60%. So they've realized that, you know, we don't give marks of, of well, occasionally it does happen, but it's unusual to give marks between 90 to 100. So your governments know what the, what the UK marking system is like, and they'll make adjustments. Mm. But that doesn't mean, please, get us only 65. Do your best. <laughs> get the 80s. <laughs> you know, do the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but don't be surprised if it's, yes, if it's 55 or 60. 65 because, is actually a good mark. Yeah, that's why I use 65. It's a very good mark. Mm. The only thing I'd like to add to that and um, the contributions that have been made there is that it's important again, and I would you hear me throughout today saying my banger, my banger, my banger. <laughs> Your scores would be there, put on my banger for you. You know, when once your grades have been assessed by the um, lecturers, they will be second marked by another lecturer, and then the, the admin staff have the responsibility of recording it on my banger. When you get back your scripts, or when you've been um, informed that the grades are out, make sure you check my banger. And there you will know whether you have failed that course. Unfortunately, I hope that will not happen to anyone. But if it has happened, then, especially if it's a course that uh, maybe you have the opportunity of um, a two-level submission assessment, maybe an exam or an a coursework, then you know you can work towards um, improving your marks. The danger is when you don't know how you have performed in one aspect of the assessment and then you 
then plan not deliberately you omit to plan to do more effectively in the other level so make sure you check your marks on my bangor it's there another avenue is the meetings you have with your personal tutor i personally every time i meet with my tutees i go through each assessment they've done with them and i ask them okay why did you what happened here and those kind of issues. So make sure if there's something that has gone wrong, you inform your personal tutor on time. We will not be able to help you when it's too late. When the senators had their meeting at the end of the year, there's nothing we can do about that. Hmm. But if it's prior to that and the extenuating circumstances, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, please let us be informed. Carry us along and we'll help you. Mm, good, thanks. Uh, Xiao, any, any comments? Oh, yeah, I would I'd like to add something. Um, here in Bangor, assessment methods are, have different kinds. You might have set exams or you might have uh, written essays. But here, many academics would prefer to accessing you through oral presentations mm. or uh, your contribution to seminars. And please remember to read your module outline because usually the assessment criteria and marking criteria will be provided in the outline. Thank you. Mm, thanks. Good. Yeah. Finally, just a very quick one. You'll see some modules listed as optional. That means they're optional. Some modules are compulsory. You have to take them. And some modules are core. Now, the core modules are the ones you should pay attention to because you have to pass a core module in order to pass your degree program. Mm. You fail a core module, you fail the degree. Now, as far as my MSc students are concerned, their core degree module is the research project. So even if they get 90% in the taught modules and they fail the research project, they fail the degree. Okay? Mm. So pay attention to core modules. Mucho importante. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all very much. Right. Well, um, time is going on, so we'll have to move to our next question, um, which is something which always crops up every year, so it's an important question. So, um, yes. Plagiarism, yes. Well, uh, shall we uh, start with uh, Zhao? Plagiarism, well, that's the word, very important. Um, referencing, actually, is the best way to avoid being charged with plagiarism. Remember to uh, make full reference of what you used, and uh, you use the peer-reviewed articles or journals they are almost, uh, most of them are available online freely. Hmm. And uh, do not, not do not, um, uh, I won't advise you to use Wikipedia as your primary source. <laughs> yeah, because they are not uh, peer reviewed and the sources are not reliable <coughs> enough. Okay, thank you. Mm, thank you, Mahai. Yeah, thank you. Well, it is a very important issue. And although we say referencing, but that doesn't mean you go to a reference and you pick up a paragraph and you put it there and you put the reference. It doesn't work like that. No. What we have, we have a, a software called Turnitin. When you submit your assignment or your report, you will submit an electronic version as well and will go through this Turnitin software and will <coughs> tell you the similarity between your work and whatever has been published nationally, internationally, or within your school. Last year reports, other students' assignments. So even if you copy from a colleague, from your friends, it will appear and turn it in. But we are not going to look at the percentage of similarity. Because if I want to talk about Bangor, for example, I say, well, Bangor is a city in North you know, Wales. Whatever you write it, you write it the same. But we are looking for like large paragraphs, large information being taken from the same source. Even if you reference that source, you have to rephrase it yourself. Read it, understand it, and write it your own 
words. Uh, uh, all departments will not take this issue easily. Any kind of or any shape you want to you know to do it, it will appear. Maybe the problem with if you have assignments required math, so you do equations, it will be similar. So we do recognize we are not going to just rely on the turn it in. We will use common sense. This is being you know taken from this or that, and then pictures or, or figures mm -hmm. from data. You don't take a picture or a figure from uh, an article or from a book unless you take a permission from the author as well. So you, you reference whatever you like, but data has to be <coughs> acknowledged by the author themselves. You know, I would like to use your data in my report. You know, sending an email. If they say yes, then you can use the data. Hmm. Otherwise, you can't. It's a very innocent mistake to make by copying yeah. something yeah. without realizing, isn't it? Yeah. I, I give an example of some instances which have happened in the School of Biological Sciences recently. <laughs> Last year, now group working is a very good thing when you're together doing the same practical or the same course. It's nice to get together and discuss things out. Um, what we had last year was a series of a number of students who wrote up identical practicals. So they hadn't copied them from the web, but what they'd done is they'd got together, written the same practical out virtually identically. So we had seven or eight submissions, we put them on Turnitin, and they came up as 80%, 90% similar to all the others. Now that too is quite serious because I think it comes into collusion, which is bad. Okay, You don't want to do that. Something okay, I would just gosh. like to add is um, essentially when you're talking about plagiarism is um, you're talking about passing off someone else's work or idea as your own without acknowledging that source or even going on to submit work for which you have already received credit on as a new piece of work and it's something that we've seen happen to students before. Perhaps you have done a dissertation in another school before you came here and you're now doing dissertation, you then decide to, even though it's your piece of your work, you submit your dissertation to Bangor, we would catch you out, unfortunately. Turnitin is so ac um, accurate that it picks up so much. And in the past, we've actually um, caught people out. And if you're in the law school, please know that if you're found guilty of um, plagiarism, you can't go on to become a lawyer, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And we've had to send someone out about a year or two ago. So please, yeah. Okay. Can I say as well the outcome? You will be given zero. Mm -hmm. If we find out this is definitely uh, unfair practice, we call it, you will be given a zero in the assignment or the project or the report, you, you know, you're right. So try to avoid it, especially if you do your own work, do not pass it to others, because you will pay the price as well. You know, but, uh, and this is quite important. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in the case I talked to you about, one person had actually written the thing, and the rest of them had copied it. Now, we had no, I, we had no idea who'd done what, so they all got zero. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And do not use paid, you would go, we would see websites where people have been paid to write essays for people. Unfortunately, the reality is that the same essay they're writing for you, they have written similar essay like that for other people. So somebody did it in the law school and we caught the person. Don't, if it's possible, do your own work independently. Avoid paying for um, essay writing um, organizations. They're just taking your money for nothing. Hmm. We will catch you. Yeah. So very, very serious there. So plagiarism, avoid at all costs. So uh, um, if you need information, just check, obviously. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is an interesting question. There's something I've come across, again, uh, many uh, last few years. So um, um, we have a, a question here from... Ah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ada. I'm from Iraq. Uh, and I would like to know, uh, what should I call my teachers? <laughs> hi, sir. You can call me all, anything you like, actually. But uh, I always like to be called by my first name, which is Anil. Now, some students steadfastly refuse to do that, especially students from Nigeria. And we always have Nigerian students, and they always said, um, 
Sir, sir, sir. I once said, if you call me sir one more time, I'll make sure that in your next assessment, I'll mark you down by 20%. <laughs> and they still continued calling me. So they said, they said we can't call you. And it, it, it's, it's, it's just not respectful. Hmm. The Saudi Arabian students, by, by complete contrast, straight away called me by my first name. I actually prefer to be called by my first name. And most academics in the UK and in Bangor would prefer to be called by their first names. Okay. Unless they specifically tell you not to. I mean, I don't know anyone who would say, you know, you need to call me Professor X. I don't know anyone like that. <laughs> right. I don't know what to introduce you now, but uh, yes. how would you like to be called? Um, I mean, you can call me Amma, and I quite like that. And most lecturers, like what um, um, Anil has said, would actually like that. But what we want is that mutual respect and courtesy. What we don't want is the fact that... Um, Lecturers are approachable, and this is where the other extent to which some students abuse it is that you take an email. For me, for example, a student writes me, hi, Amo. That's not my name. My name is Ama, and Amo means something so really, really disgusting where I'm from. <laughs> so be careful. Call the person the right name, and then when you're writing an email to the person, that does not mean you throw courtesy to the wind. Uh, we are approachable, we want, we are your friends, but that professional integrity must be maintained. Something that lecturers don't really like, it's maybe you see us, Bangor is a university town, and we like, we have a life outside, you know, this place, and you see us maybe in Tesco, having a nice little time, and at that point in time, you want us to discuss your academics with you. <laughs> I'm not sure we'll truly appreciate that. There are times for approach. Call us, approach us, but be cautious and be polite. Not only to your lecturers, but also to your academic staff. Don't treat them less just because um, they are academic staff. P um, treat people with courtesy and be polite in your endeavors, both in writing and orally, and everything will be all right. Thank you. Yes. Oh, well, thank what you. Should we call teachers? Well, so, so that's a very good answer. But this, this is this is the point. You, know, you have to feel free to talk to your lecturers or your teachers, as we call them, or, or supervisors, if you are doing PhD, as long as yes, you respect their position. Uh, we encourage students to be free. We want mm -hmm. them to speak free. Speak your mind. Don't put there's a barrier between myself and the lecturer. If you want to challenge their views, for example, especially for uh, you know, postgraduates, MS, you know, master degrees, or PhD students, if you want to challenge your supervisor, go ahead. There's nothing wrong with having a point of view. Maybe you are right. The, 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 the supervisor did not get the uh, point right. But as long as you show respect, not telling that, you know, your, your supervisor, well, come on, you know, you, you know nothing. I'm trying to teach you now how to do this or that. Mm. It doesn't matter. But as long as you show respect, feel free, and and and, and you know, speak your mind, uh, put your views forward, and, and I'm sure all the lecturers will respect your your, your views. As a PhD student, uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I have a trick. Yeah, usually I will call professor if I'm not quite sure. But if they are not a professor, they would like to take it as a compliment and correct me. <laughs> that, oh, I'm not a professor, you just call me like Arma or Anil, right? But my suggestion is, before you approach a staff or your tutor, just check online, because their profile is provided on the university website, right? If he's a doctor, it would say doctor. So make sure before you approach them. Yeah. Mm. And these things change. I mean, in the States, I think my title would be associate professor because that's, a, that's the level I'm at here in the UK. Update the it's, just, it's just different. <laughs> well, no, no. I'm in the UK, so I'm just a senior lecturer. Oh. <laughs> and I do the opposite of uh, what you said. You know, if someone called me professor, I will add 20% to their bonds. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next question is kind of linked to the uh, lecturers being approachable. Um, so... We've got a question from, from Abby. I'm Abby, and I'm from the United States. Um, my question is, can I knock on my lecturer's door? Mm. 
Um, Zhao. Well, of course you can, because it's the open door policy. And it's the student's responsibility uh, to knock the lecture's door if you need any help. But uh, make sure that uh, you follow their advices and um, you just take responsible for yourself. And uh, you know, that's all. I think most of them are really easy, uh, approachable. Uh, Dr. can you uh, knock on my lecture's door? Maybe at 8 o'clock at night. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we appreciate students knocking our doors. Uh, because only students who care, students who want to learn, will knock my door. But I will answer the question only if I see you in the class. <laughs> if you don't attend. Uh, and it's happened before, where not only knocking my door, during exam time, I went to a few students saying, are you sure you are in the right exam room? I've never seen you before. But they are doing my paper, my, my, you know, my exam paper. So it, uh, you are allowed. Well, we, we, we encourage students to knock our doors. But if you don't attend really the lectures, I'm not prepared to give you a private lecture in my office. <laughs> just try to attend, and we are happy to, you know. Just a little point as well. Don't take us wrong sometime. If I have meeting with somebody else as well, or in two or three minutes I will have a lecture, or I have to leave my office, and I will say, well, sorry, not now. Can you come back in an hour or, or can, can you back you know, tomorrow? Don't take it as a negative response from the lecture. Because sometimes we have our own timetable as well. If I want to, you know, if I have to rush. If you want to make life easier, just send an email and say, well, can I, you know, I want to see you at some time. Mm -hmm. Can we arrange for a meeting? But in general, no. See the door open, knock the door. And if they are free, you are welcome. Yeah. I mean, the, the best sort of question to ask is a question on which you've made some effort yourself. You've tried and you're having some difficulty. The worst sort of question to ask is to go to a lecture after a two-day or three-day practical and say, I don't understand any of it, which means you haven't actually put much effort into trying to figure out what the practical is about. So make an effort and ask specific questions, you know. I don't understand molarities or whatever. Fine, you know, we can help you with that. Mm. Any extra thing to say, Anna? Yeah, yeah. just to add, one of the things that I'm, I'm very pleased with is that Bangor is great. Not just great. Our past students have said that we are great in the National Student Survey. And one of the areas that identified us as being great for is the feedback that they receive from lecturers. So you can knock on our door, especially when you, when you need feedback. But make sure that when you're coming to knock on our door, you're just not coming to knock for knocking sake. There is a purpose, you know. We would attend to you within the right time and observe office hours. Some um, teaching staff may be working between London and Bangor, and you go to knock on the day they're in London. We have a campus in London, and they're not there. And then you complain is not fair on them. Respect their time, respect their schedule, also give them time. Not only knocking on their door physically, but knocking on their door electronically. <coughs> when you send emails to lecturers, please give them a bit of time to respond. But what we want you to do is to come to us. Good. Thank you all very much. Excellent. Well, the next question is quite a general one, a general question, which, uh, but a very important one as well, which uh, many students find difficult when they first arrive at Bangor. Yes. Do you want to uh, start with that there? Huh? Extremely important. Um, the person who, you, you will be assigned a personal tutor. So that should be the first person whom you would approach for help, or you could approach the director of your course. But the tutor is the best person to approach. Anything you say to the tutor is confidential and won't be disclosed to anyone else. And the tutor, he or she, knows if he or she can't actually solve your problem themselves, they know who to send you to. The last thing we want you to do is if you have a problem of any kind, is not to say anything not to approach anyone, just sort of stew in your room and say, God, things are getting really bad. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get to that stage. 
you think something is not right, something isn't working properly, go and see someone about it so we can do something about it. If you don't tell us that things are wrong, the only time we find out that things ain't working is when you see you're not in the class and we look at your marks, 25, 30, 38, say, whoop, you know, something isn't working here. Okay? And then we try and get hold of you, which might be too late then. So be proactive if you need help. Be proactive. The personal tutor, yeah. Yeah. Come on. Absolutely. Great. Um, thanks for that question. Um, something that um, we want you to be aware is that there's so many support services available in Bangor, from your international support um, officers, student support officers, who you must have met. For those that were around last week, they were in those lovely purple T-shirts. We engage them for the whole year. So they're not just limited to the orientation week. Those people that were your friends during that period, you can always, you know, go to them for some of the support. Besides them, we've all, and then the personal tutors we've talked about and your module organizers, organizers, we've got the international office and they provide a range of student-related services in association with um, other support um, services in the university. There's the Study Skills Center, and I find most national or European students take advantage of this, the Study Skills Center, but international students, they don't. Most of us have never had assessment for things like dyslexia. We don't even know what it means. And we might actually be dyslexic. It's nothing to be ashamed of. If you find that you may need that little support, go to the international office, Tell them, they will discuss with you, they will direct you to, you know, the right people. Within the international office as well, you've got this, um, the English um, center. For those of you that English may not be your first language, they put throughout the year, they put on different English um, speaking and writing examinations or courses for you. And I found, I've even referred students from Nigeria we speak English throughout school, but we don't really write. So I've referred people there to go and get their work looked at. And the advantage of this is that they help them express themselves in more appropriate manners and thereby improve their grades. There are all sorts of student support services. My bank, um, the Bangor website has a range of them. Just make sure you use them. Don't wait till it's too late. And if by chance your boyfriend breaks up with you, I hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, there's a counseling center. Just make sure you speak to someone. There's no issue that is too absurd that we haven't heard before. Do you understand? All we're there to do is to help you and make your experience a great one. Thank you. Mama, if I need help, who should I ask? Well, and I, I hope the queue is not too long <laughs> <laughs> because too many people are breaking up, you know, relationships these days. You know, well, my view, and I was in Tanasha students a few years ago, and the best source of information is yourselves. They try to work with each other, try to speak to each other. The best way to improve your language, if, if your, you know, first language is not English, is to mix with other students from other nationalities, especially if they don't, well, they don't speak your own language. This is where you find it now, it's two benefits. The study is one side, and then you improve your English language. We, okay, we study English you know, in, in our school's time, even overseas, but we learn how to write, how to read, but we don't practice how to use it as main language in our daily life. And this is a very good opportunity for you. The three or four years you are going to stay in Bangor or in the UK is to mix with other societies and, and you know, that will help you to improve your English language. It's not only that. You will have friends from all over the world. You will live with a degree as well as friends from different countries. I went to a wedding a few weeks ago, and, and it, it was an African guy, and you don't, 24 different nationalities 
and the wedding reception. Because he was really good in integrating with people, trying to meet people from you know, all over the world. This is a real benefit. It's, it's a really good opportunity for you to use it. Mm. Good point. Joe, um, who did oh. you ask for help when you were doing oh, your PhD? I, I agree with Mohammed. I would uh, ask for help from my friends. By friends, I mean not only people from China, I mean all kinds of friends from all over the world. Um, but I would like to add that you do not have to speak English all the time. We encourage to speak English, but for international students from uh, Arabic countries, from Africa, for, who speak other languages, they can, you know, try to speak Chinese, right? And. Um, uh, also, we have we share different culture, different values, and we cook different foods. <laughs> so it's very important for us to communicate with each other and to make progress. Thank you. Mm. Yes, taking the opportunity to mix with as many people as you can while you're here. Well, time is really going quickly, and we've reached our last question. So, um, our last question is from yes. Okay, thanks. Xiao, working part-time, any implications for your studies? Oh, part-time. Um, I used to work a part-time job in the marketing department uh, to, mail it, to do the mailing out job. It's a manual job. Or sometimes to uh, pick up the phones from the students uh, asking questions. Um, my advice is that don't let part-time job to interrupt with your study. Mm -hmm. Your study always goes first. If you want to exp experience something more, uh, you could find part-times uh, first from the university website, or you can hear something from your friends, and uh, just enjoy your life. Yeah. Mm. I think you're actually legally allowed 12 hours a week, I think. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. Yeah. Yeah. 20. Yeah. But um, what I would add is that even though you allow 20, and this is from my experience as um, a master's student and a PhD student, you've got to refocus your energy. I would not advise you to start working between now and December for the first semester. My advice is you're coming to a new environment. And that was the best advice someone gave me when I came to the UK, because I was self-sponsored. And one of my you know, senior friends told me, um, try and get to grips with your study first, the first few months. Understand what it is you are here to do before you think about even part-time work. Because the danger with um, you're juggling so much at this point in time. The danger with running to go and get a part-time job now is that it could have effects on your performance. That's beyond talking about, you know, sometimes um, we start with part-time, and I know that when I started my first job during the Christmas holiday, it was part-time, and then in January, they tempted me with more money by asking me to go full-time. And thankfully, I'm a lawyer, and I knew the implications on my visa. I just told them, no, I can't do it. Some other people who were my friends risked it. And I do know two of them that up till today have not finished their studies because they just could not submit. We had assignments due end of January, and in going full time, they could not submit the assignments, and it just spiraled into a lot of things. So for now, the focus should be on your studies, at least these first few months. And then when you've come to grips with it, then you can then look at part-time work later on in the year. But be wary of full-time job. There's no way you can be a full-time student and a full-time worker. You will fail. Sorry to say that. I have to be that blunt. Mm -hmm. And you're here to study first of all, and again, you could be deported. It has happened in the past where we had um, a Nigerian student that was picked up by the UKBA because they, 
The UK is a beautiful country in that everything is transparent on the system. You think they don't know, they just combine the tax and um, the salaries that you're getting from job A and the salaries you're getting from job B. You have a national insurance number, they align them together, they know, voila, we've caught one and you're out. You, the parents would have paid your fees, or even if you're self-sponsoring, you would have paid your fees. Unfortunately, you'll be thrown out. So, your studies are primary. Focus on that first. I'm, I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, yeah. it's really, really important that you spend the majority of your time working. We realize that some of you have financial problems, mm -hmm. and you do need to do a little bit of, little bit of, of work but do not let it interfere with your studies. And one thing which we will not do as a university is to take that into account. You know, if you fail some modules and you say, I'm sorry, the reason I failed is because I've been, I've been working, I mean, that is not an acceptable, uh, acceptable reason, and we will not take that into account. There's a famous phrase in Swahili, going back to my youth, which is, Shauri Yaakob, it's your problem. <laughs> you know, it's not our problem, so you have to, you have to be aware of what you're doing. Yeah, well, but still, we, we do encourage students to do part-time work. Especially now we have what we call Employability Award. We want the students to work part-time if they have extra time. So it won't affect their studies. But again, if you see yourself, well, started a part-time job, and then you started to become behind in submitting your assignments, you are not following the, you know, the, the lectures, you have to give up. However, it is, especially for you know, young students, you need to learn what the meaning of work, teamwork, by practicing that through a, a, you know, a, a part-time job. So that's why uh, now with, 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 with the university, we have the Employability Award. Mm. If you pick up, I think, 200 points, you, you need to look at this in your my banger. I think there are quite a, a lot of information about that uh, when, when you report your work. Uh, it will allow, you know, help you not only the, the university or your course will teach you your field of study, but part-time work will teach you what, you know, respect time because you are, uh, you know, part-time, so you are working from this hour to this hour, so you have to be in time what the meaning of teamwork, you are working within you know, a, a team of uh, uh, employers in your place, as long as it won't affect your study. Mm -hmm. So we encourage it, but put cautious. We, you know, we need yeah. to be careful not to go too far with, 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 with your work. Yeah. Never mind, even if you don't need the financial set, it will help you when you grow up. You know, when you put in your CV, I had, I don't know, BA in, in engineering, and I worked as part-time in this place, and it will add another point in your CV. Yeah. That's an important point as well, and maybe consider volunteering as well. Yes. It doesn't have to be paid work. There's plenty of opportunities at the university, the students' union, to volunteer maybe in a field similar to your course, which would help you. I think it does depend on what you do. I mean, mm. if you spend yeah. your time in a fish and chip shop, might not be that great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's important to mention as well, for those of you with a visa, it's 20 hours a week. For those from Europe, you can work as many hours as you want, but you need to balance it with your studies. Well, excellent. We had a, a very good uh, batch of questions there, um, very diverse. Is there anyone else from the floor who would like to ask a question, who has any comments maybe, um, something we haven't touched on, something you'd like to know? Any questions on anything? Yes. That how do you know who your personal tutor is? Um, your different schools, which school are you from? Uh, psychology. psychology. Would have um, an orientation event with you. Yeah. You've had that. So in the next few days, you would be receiving emails from them. I know in law, for example, I've already met my personal t um, tutees this morning because we want to catch you and retain you, so we're mandated to meet you immediately. So continue looking at your emails. There will be communication from your personal tutor regarding um, e um, requests for meetings. Yeah. And if you don't, and if by the end of middle of next week you have not heard anything from them,
contact, there would be an administrative officer in your school. Go and see the person and then they'll make arrangements for you. In, in some cases, if you don't actually know, the course director may be your personal tutor. I mean, for the MSc courses in SBS, the course directors are the tutors of the students. So, I'm your tutor. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. yes. If I discover something or invent something during my studies and I want to patent it in UK, that's possible to do patent in UK for international students? No reason why not, yes, yes. but I think the patent will be held by the university. Yes, <laughs> if it's part of your coursework, yes. Now, if, uh, if uh, whatever I invent or discover is not related to my academic studies, then... In which case, don't tell the university anything about it and go and patent it yourself. Yes. <laughs> Just tell me. Yeah, yeah. Try to search for patent agencies. There are agencies you can contact and you tell them, I have an idea, I want to patent that, and they will charge you quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're not using the university's resources and the facilities to yes. support your patent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those of you who have a biological background might have heard about PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. The person who invented was actually working for CITES in, in California when he thought of the idea. And he got a few thousand dollars for it. The patent for PCR was sold by Hoffman LaRoche for several million. He was an employee. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could uh, describe what the two week assessment period after winter break is like. Like, is there a week apart for studying and then a week of assessments, or is, are they all like throughout the two weeks? Oh, the two weeks after Christmas, the after study Christmas. Which yeah. school are you in? Environmental um, science. Okay. Environmental science. Uh, when you come back after your, there's no, what happens is that before the Christmas holiday, you would have had your less, last lecture. You're expected during the Christmas holiday to study. It's very difficult, but when you come back, the most likely thing you're going to be doing is going straight into the exam room. Exams, yeah. So it's, in a sense, it, it, it's, it's just prior to the exam period. Yes. Yeah. So, so keep off the Christmas pudding yes. for a bit. <laughs> it's, I, I found that really, really weird when I came to the UK. And for those of you who are not used to the weather, you know, by that time the weather would have changed and it would be dark by 3 o'clock. So prepare to readjust. Those are some of the things you might need to think about. You start feeling sleepy much earlier than now. Now we still get, it was still bright till about five, half six, seven, half seven. seven yeah. But later on, we'll start getting dark from three, four. So adjust your mind and study. Do all your studying if it's possible before you go home for Christmas. Then enjoy the 24th, 25th, 26th, depending on your religion. Yeah. From 27, pick up your books and start revising. That's yeah. the best advice I can give you. Well, oh, it's, it's, this is for the first semester. Yes. That doesn't mean we will give you two, three weeks in, in second semester exams in May. In May, no, no, you finish on Friday, your you know, last week of the, of the teaching. The next Monday, you'll have exam. And this is where we encourage students to learn what we call time management. You need to learn to organize yourself. I have assignments to do, and I have revision. And I have part-time work, and I have to watch Manchester United versus Arsenal. <laughs> so it has to be you know, a, a part of your work, part of your learning process is time management. I have, well, you are lucky you, have, you, are, you, you, are, you are having the exams after Christmas. Some universities, even in Bangor, yeah. a few years ago, we used to have the exams before Christmas. So we don't give the students two or three weeks off to prepare for their exams. You have the whole semester for you to prepare yourself. Uh, there's one thing which is, which on the face of it seems to be very good, but can actually be a problem. I don't know about other schools, but in biological sciences, all our lectures are recorded on a thing called Panopto. So there's a video of the lecturer, PowerPoints are up there, there's a recording, everything is synchronized, all the notes are synchronized, and they're put on the web for you. You'll be able to access them through Blackboard. Some students say, well, I don't really need to do very much now because it's all there on the web, and when it comes to exam time, I'll mug it up. 
you haven't got the time to do that. You cannot mug up a 20 lecture course in a couple of days just because it's on the web. It's on the web, yeah. But if you don't actually deal with it when it's been given, you won't, you won't make it. And I think this is one of the problems when it comes to attendance. Some students think, well, the lecture will It's all up, yeah, that's right. Online, They're the so ones who fail. I banger, I'll get the lecture. But it's not all about the you know, PowerPoints or about you, you, you need to attend. Lectures are interactives as well. Yeah. Sometimes you need to ask questions yourself. Yeah. Mm. You did not understand. So it's not, do not re rely on the fact that lecture will be you know, online. So I mean, think about it. If, if it really was that simple, I mean, all my lectures from last year have been recorded. I could just say, right, I, you know, I won't bother now. I'll just, they can just watch them online. It's not like that because every lecture is different. You're interacting with the students and that's how students learn. The other thing you shouldn't do, I'm sure you know about that, is write something down. You're not, you're not watching a movie. I mean, frequently when I'm lecturing, I see students in the front row just sort of with their hands folded looking at me like they're watching a movie. Now, if you do that, you don't learn anything. When you start writing stuff down, you've actually got to understand what's on the screen. Writing it down in your own words, that's the way to learn. Mm -hmm. And to come back to possibly the first thing, people say, what's the difference between the UK and other countries? The real main difference is we're trying to teach you how to think not learn a huge body of information by rote, by heart, pointless, Google it, it's not important. Learn how to think, that's the important thing. Okay, well on that point, we'll, uh, we'll have to finish uh, for the day. Thank you all very much uh, for coming today. I hope you found it very useful. I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Ama Ayo, Dr. Anil Shirsat, Dr. Mohamed Mabrook, and Jean Ma from Education. So to our panel, thank you. No worries. Thank you. Right. Back to the line.